All right, welcome everyone. Because I'm completely out of breath and exhausted, because I ran across this campus to be here somewhere close to on time, this is going to be a very short introduction. But <laughs> because otherwise I might pass out. You know, it takes about two hours to get here from, from the Bay Area, from uh, Silicon Valley. <sighs> anyway, um, <laughs> so it, it's, it's my great pleasure to have for this week's speaker, uh, speakers, in it, basically, uh, both Alfred Lin and Tony Shea. Um, this is the problem with giving the introduction because I'm still out of breath. But um, uh, they're both going to tell you a bit about themselves during the presentation. But they are serial entrepreneurs in the true sense of the word, meaning that um, uh, they've incubated a number of companies. They, they've started company after company. And Zappos is one of the companies that they ended up effectively starting out of their process of incubating companies. In this case, Zappos, over the last few years, since, since uh, uh, Tony has been involved with it particularly, has grown from $1.6 million of revenue per year to now, and this year I understand the number, is close to $800 million per year of revenue. So certainly a tremendous growth. And I can only imagine that there are tons of secrets behind how uh, you're able to achieve all of this. And, and certainly, as serial entrepreneurs, I think they've, they've learned that secret in time. So with that, let me have you guys come up. Can everyone hear me? Cool. Uh, I guess before we get started, just out of curiosity, prior to this, how many people had heard of Zappos before? And how many are customers and have bought from us? Very cool. It's better than our previous talk where nobody <laughs> raised their hand. So, um, so I'm gonna, uh, I guess we're going to give a quick uh, intro about how we met. Alfred and I have actually known each other for about 13 years, and we originally met in college. I uh, was running a pizza business with a college roommate at the time, and Alfred was my number one customer. <laughs> well, in addition to liking to eat a lot, I, I negotiated a great deal from Tony, and I was buying lots of pizzas from him, whole pizzas from him, and I was taking it upstairs and selling it by the slice. So uh, that's why Alfred's our COO and CFO today. Uh, and and so this presentation, we've kind of, we've actually we put together two different presentations and uh, there's kind of one that we use when we're talking to investors and bankers and Alfred's gonna go over that one and there's a second presentation after and, and we'll kind of, I guess, give the uh, shorter version of the combining them because we really wanna make this more Q&A afterwards and make it much more interactive. So uh, I'll let Alfred start. So I get to tell you about the boring stuff so, from the investor stuff. So this is uh, Zappos at a glance, which is, um, you know, the story about Zappos, there's a lot of facts in here, but Zappos was founded in 1999, and uh, it was founded when Nick Swimmer, our founder, uh, was looking for a particular pair of shoes, um, and he went to a mall in uh, South San Francisco, and he went from store to store went, trying to look for these particular shoes. I think they were Airwalk, Desert Boots, um, I don't know if you've seen them, but they're actually kind of ugly. Um, but he went to one store, couldn't find the right size. He went to another store, couldn't find the right style. And he went to a third store, and they didn't have the right color. So he went home empty-handed and frustrated. So he started looking online um, and uh, did some searches. Uh, I think Google was just starting up back then. He went, he went and did a search and uh, couldn't really find anything either online. So. It's 1999, so he figured he would just quit his day job um, and start a company. And then um, he actually called me and Tony. Tony and I were um, starting, we had just started a small incubation company and a, and a venture fund and left us one of the most interesting 
voicemails that I've ever heard because he started out saying, hey, I have this crazy idea. Um, I want to sell shoes on the internet. And I think either Tony and I had our finger on the delete button because we thought it was crazy too. But then he shared with us how big the market was, which was there was $40 billion of footwear being sold in just the United States. And back then, 5% was already being done by mail order. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that the internet was going to be bigger than mail order. So we figured that that was a pretty good thing to start. Uh, so we both invested in the company. And uh, over time, we both really fell in love with the company. And we ended up uh, working at the company. But the original idea was actually because Nick couldn't find a particular pair of shoes that he wanted to offer the greatest selection that you can find on the internet. And over time, we have changed that to providing the best online service possible. And we eventually want to be associated with the brand that, is, that provides the absolute best customer service. And hopefully one day, nobody will actually even think about us as a footwear company. So today, uh, we do sell primarily footwear. We, uh, we started selling f uh, apparel last year. We sold uh, handbags. We started handbags a few years ago, and we're getting into all sorts of different uh, accessories like sunglasses and timing devices. But uh, we believe that we're trying to provide the best online shopping, uh, shopping experience possible. And with that, you know, we provide basically free shipping both ways. Free, and currently, we ship everything overnight. So we're trying to satisfy the instant gratification that, you, that we all have when we're purchasing something. You want, you want to buy something, you want to get it tomorrow. Um, there's a lot of stats here. We have over 1,200 brands across all the things that we sell, uh, very wide selection. We have more than 4 million um, units of uh, product in our warehouse in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and uh, if you look at all the different SKUs that we have, this is a very SKU-intensive business. We have about 900,000, uh, over 900,000 unique different UPCs. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting, uh, just from a management standpoint of the inventory, it's a pretty interesting business. Yeah, and uh, just to give you an idea of the size of our warehouse, uh, we actually have two warehouses right across the street from each other. And combined, they're the size of 17 football fields. So when you actually go in there, it's just overwhelming. So, you know, we I alluded to this a little bit. We, we're very proud of the customer uh, service that we provide. And the reason we provide customer service is because customers come, they come back, and they, come, they buy and buy again. And currently, we have about 6.6, 6.5 million customers, uh, which represents only about 2.2% of the US population. So we have a lot of room for growth. Uh, just serving the U.S. population. And the thing that we look at the, a lot uh, is how often they come back. And uh, of the 6.6 .6 million customers, about 3.1 uh, million of them have uh, purchased in the last 12 months. And we pride ourselves as a company that ha you know, has a lot of repeat customer purchases. Of the, companies that, uh, of the cu cu uh, customers that come back, um, in the next 12 months, they purchase two and a half times. On any given day, if you, we have a sales report that is sent out, basically, we like to know how, um, how sales are doing each and every hour. 75% um, of the purchases are, that are being made are being made by customers that have purchased from us before. And um, this is not particularly surprising. It's probably true in almost any business. It's easier to sell to your existing customers than to new customers. And so your existing customers spend more than your new, new customers. Uh, we've won a lot of awards, um, and these are just some of them. And on the next page, we, uh, there, we've been featured in a bunch of articles and um, TV shows. But what we really pay attention to is customers and customer reviews. Um, and these are two sample customer emails that uh, we've gotten from our customers. One is talking about how much they love the product, the, the next day delivery. The other one uh, is actually a competitor of ours who th is writing in to thank us for sending a client to them, a customer to them, because we didn't have the particular product that uh, this particular customer wanted. And that sounds like a crazy thing, but we 
value the customer relationship so much more than any particular sale. We're willing to refer customers somewhere else if we don't have the particular product that they're looking for. And the reason that we pay so much attention to um, our customers is two things. Our growth, we believe, comes from repeat customer purchases and word of mouth. And all this graph here is basically just uh, almost, not all of it, but a great, good deal of it is from repeat customers and from word of mouth and rather than marketing. And we pride ourselves on, on that. And uh, this year, hopefully, we'll do more than 800 million in gross merchandise sales, which is getting to be pretty big numbers. We do spend money on marketing, and the reason we spend money on marketing is because, well, if you have this great word of mouth, it leverages the marketing dollars that you spend. Um, almost 85% uh, of the dollars that we spend uh, is on the internet, uh, whether it's through c comparison shopping engines or through keyword buys uh, or through other banners that we may purchase. 15% uh, is offline. Uh, most of it is in print. We've tried other uh, mediums, um, but most of it is in print for the offline. 35% um, of our customers, these are new customers that register on any given day, will say that they heard uh, from us, they heard about Zappos from either a friend or family member or coworker, uh, et cetera. And so we're very proud of, of that. And we spend enormous amount of time trying to make sure that whatever we do spend on mar marketing is in, in a very disciplined way. Uh, every single new customer, we analyze how much we spend on that new customer and how much they make on a first purchase and what their expected life value of that customer purchases. Uh, unlike most companies, we want uh, our spending on marketing to be profitable on the first order. So what do we mean by cus customer service in action? How many of you have purchased some, um, something on the internet, had a problem, and wanted to call someone and couldn't f find the 800 number? How so about half of you. So we take a completely different approach. We don't hide our 800 number. Our 800 number is on the upper left-hand corner um, of every single page. So if you have a problem, you're surfing, you want to shop with us and talk to someone, uh, even to just bounce ideas because you're not sure whether you should get the purple one or the green one, um, you feel free to call in and ask any question you like. If you want to um, order pizza and you can't find a pizza place, feel free to call in as well. <laughs> Tony will tell you a little story about that later. Um, so this year we started, um, actually last December we started a free promo uh, promotion of overnight shipping and that was a big hit and so starting this in January, sometime in January we just extended it and then decided to just ship everything overnight, free overnight shipping um, and that has we've gotten a lot of positive feedback about that because as you, as all of you know, some of these purchases, whether it's a clothing or shoes, it's a very emotional purchase. So you want to get that product as quickly as possible. Uh, we also allow you to sh return the product 365 days, no questions asked, um, and we pay for the shipping as well. Um, what you should expect to experience is very fast fulfillment. Any order that is placed on Zappos, uh, we try to fulfill that order inside of four hours, um, which means in our, once, as soon as we receive your order, it goes to the warehouse. They are picking, packing, and shipping uh, your order within four hours. Um, and then we put that on a UPS truck, and it goes to the UPS Walport Hub in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, where they fly it to where they need to fly it for, for delivery. Um, and uh, if you ever have a problem, as I was saying, you can call our 800 number, and you should expect to have not just great customer experience, but we, we like to sort of think of it as a, a personal emotional connection with, with you if you have a problem. Uh, we like to say that every single call that it comes in or every single email, it's a branding event for the company. There's a way for us to interact with the customer and make it a special relationship. Um, and as I said before, we will occasionally direct customers. If we don't have something, we will direct you to a competitor website because we feel that the long-term value and the relationship is much higher than any particular sale. 
So some of the things, this kind of stuff um, is interesting because I, I think it's a little shocking to a lot of people running businesses. Um, if, you're in a, if you're running a call center, a lot of call centers are run uh, in a way where their agents have to achieve a certain um, average call duration. So for an average call, they have to be able to answer that call within uh, one and a half minutes or two minutes, whatever the, their standard is. And so whenever you do talk to someone who's a call center agent, a lot, often they're trying to rush you off the phone. We actually don't measure call times whatsoever. Um, our belief is that whatever your problem is, we'll spend as much time as we need to spend to resolve that problem. And if it takes 15 minutes or an hour, we will stay on the line with you to resolve that problem. We don't, actually, we don't have any upsell um, performance metrics. We don't measure upsells at all. Um, it, we don't want to push product on you. Um, that's very different than a lot of um, companies out there. Um, American Express, even if you're trying to activate your new card, they tell you to hold on because they want to transfer you to an agent to sell you something that you completely don't need. We don't do that. Um, we run our warehouse and our call center 24-7. Um, and it's probably not the most efficient from a dollar standpoint way to run the, call, the warehouse or the call center because most of your orders come in uh, as, during certain hours of the day and you have fewer orders throughout the night. Um, but we run it 24-7 because if there's ever a problem, we want to take care of our customers and we want to get the product out of the warehouse as quickly as possible on, into your hands. Uh, we inventory all of our product, um, and that is a big expense for the company, but we believe that it's important to control the inventory and to show you only product that we have in inventory that, that we can ship. Um, you as customers all, have, all know that if you see a product and you want to buy it, you expect to get it, and if for some reason you get an email back that they don't have it in, in, in stock, it's kind of disappointing and we, let, we don't like to disappoint our customers. Um, this stuff, uh, the last three bullet points, is something that uh, Tony is going to talk a more about in the 10 lessons learned in, in e-commerce uh, a little bit more. But we have found that it's very, very important to manage the culture of the company. And for us, culture is very, very important. So when, you, when you're hired into Zappos, uh, the first four weeks that you spend is not the job that you're hired to do. Um, we, we uh, put you in four weeks of training where you learn about the history of the company, what our core values are, why we think they're important. We spend two more weeks teaching you about um, how to take a call, and we, we put you on the call center floor for a week so you can take calls, deal with customers, and understand what Im why we think service is important. Uh, time permitting, we'll also send you to our Kentucky warehouse where you will learn how to pick, pack, ship, um, and um, process returns, all of which seems like pretty menial tasks, but that's the guts of the business, which is to understand the operations. And you get to get the sense of understanding the operations before you start becoming a programmer, so you know the systems a lot better, or you get to understand how to move product around in, in the warehouse and why things need to be accounted a, a different way uh, when you're an accountant. So it's very, very important to us that people understand the guts, uh, the history of the company and the guts of the business before they start their jobs. Um, this is something that I think is, the last point is very, very interesting, which is that we spend all, a lot of time evaluating people on their fit for the company. So 50% of your, um, your, the interview process is based on your technical abilities and perf and your ability to do the job, and then the other 50% is whether you fit the culture of Zappos. Uh, and the same is true, not just with the interview, but throughout the, the evaluation pro process and during performance reviews. So with that, uh, Tony will tell you a little bit about some of the lessons we've learned uh, in e-commerce. So uh, you just heard the presentation that uh, we usually give to bankers and investors. And you know, from hearing it, it sounds like you know, I'd love to stand up here and tell you that you know, we had this grand master plan from day one, and for the past eight and a half years, we've just been executing on that master plan. But the truth is, 
there was no master plan. We hardly even had a regular plan. And uh, it really made a lot of mistakes along the way. And so I'm going to share with you today some of the mistakes we made and some of the lessons learned. Um, but I, I guess one of the things that we are really good at at Zappos is, well, I guess one, we're not afraid to make mistakes. And two, we look at each mistake as a learning opportunity. And as long as we keep learning from those mistakes and, and recover from the mistakes quickly, then we actually end up being a much stronger company and we're much more willing to take risks. And that's something that's part of our culture. We, we try to encourage people just to try things out. And uh, you know, it may not work out, it may be a mistake, but as long as you learn for, from it, then that's okay. So uh, lesson number one is that the e-commerce business is uh, built on repeat customers. So Alfred gave you our stats on our repeat customers, but we didn't always focus on repeat customers. Actually, when Zappos first started back in 99 during the dot-com boom, we pretty much did what all the other uh, internet companies were doing back then. We spent a lot of uh, money on high-profile advertising. For example, we bought the uh, billboard behind Home Plate for the Giants, and uh, that cost us, I think, $75,000. We tracked it, and we got four customers out of that. So. <laughs> You know, and, and we did it all in the name of you know, acquiring market share and uh, you know, building a prof great profile. And you know, that's actually a really good strategy if your goal is to go out of business as quickly as possible. So we stopped that when uh, we realized that you know, just looking at, even though every other dot com at the time, it seemed like, was doing this, you know, we kind of realized that this, we just couldn't make the numbers work, so we uh, kind of scaled back, and instead of trying to worry about new customers, we just focused on, okay, what can we do to make customers that we already have become repeat customers? How do we make them happier? How do we get them to come back again and again? And lesson number two, Oh, actually, before number two. So actually, this is some of our uh, repeat customer data. And so you can see that as we focused on how to make our existing customers happy, uh, the percent of we, this is what we look at internally. So the first column is the percent of people that bought in a certain month, so in March 2001, that ended up buying again over the next 12 months. And you can see how like every year we've been improving that number. And then the second column is the number of times they buy over the next 12 months. And the number that we look at internally is what you get if you multiply those two so that you're taking both of those effects into account. So over the years, we've worked gradually on uh, improving those numbers. Uh, lesson number two is that word of mouth really works online. Uh, and you, know, you guys all, all know this. And uh, for us, I think you know, we kept initially trying to get new customers. And then I think we just kind of woke up one day and realized that if we treat our existing customers you know, above and beyond what they were expecting, then they're going to tell their customer, they're going to tell their friends. And you know, with a click of a mouse, they can instantly tell their friends, I know whether it's 50 other email addresses they can forward to or 100. And you know, sometimes from we give this talk and we're talking to conferences where they're not all internet savvy and so someone in the audience will sometimes raise their hand and ask, well, you know, what if, you know, but how valid are those other 50 email addresses, right? You don't know who they all are. Like, are they real friends or is the one that calls themselves Fashion Diva 69 actually, you know, some guy in a basement petting his baby goat or something? And, <laughs> and, and Okay, so it's 49, but it's still a lot more effective than you know us going spending money on the uh, on the baseball ads or you know the high-profile advertising. Lesson number three is don't compete on price. So when we first started, we um, we also experimented with $10 off for first-time customers, and that was actually that actually got us a lot of new customers, but. What we found was that those customers weren't loyal. As soon as a competitor offered $11 off, then they would go to that competitor. And so we, re it took us probably about a year or so, but 
today Zappos actually doesn't offer any, you won't find any coupons on any of the, on any of the coupon sites. You'll never find us offering blanket promotions or discounts uh, or any, any special incentives because we really want the, our customers to buy from us for our service and for our selection. And we're, we are consciously knowing that we're giving up the price sensitive customers. And for us, that, we think that makes a lot of sense because it's really hard to get into a price war. Like at, it, it ends up being lose-lose for you and your competitors. And, uh, and everyone, it's always easy for someone to just outdo you. And unless you're Walmart, getting into a price war just is a way, like you're never going to win that game because someone's always willing to discount more. So we actually don't discount at all. Uh, you know, we do mark stuff down at the end of the season, but in terms of, you know, coupons that you send out, if you search for coupon codes on anywhere on the internet for Zappos, you'll never find it. Lesson number four, make sure that your website inventory is 100% accurate. So when we first started, we actually used to get inventory fees from our manufacturers that we worked with. And they were maybe anywhere from 80 to 90% accurate. And you know, how many people here have bought something online and then they notify you a day, a week later that, oh, we're actually out of stock? That's almost everyone in this room. So it, like, that experience like, sucks, right? Like, and, and, and for us, we sometimes wouldn't find out for two weeks from the manufacturer that they were out of stock. And then our customers would get mad at us and then tell them, tell us you know, two weeks later that they were never going to shop with us again and they're going to tell their 49 other friends that never shop with us again. So, so we spent a lot of effort actually getting our inventory systems. Uh, at first we worked on the manufacturer data feeds, getting them from 80% to 90% to eventually 95%, but even that wasn't enough and so we actually decided to build our own warehouse, inventory everything ourselves and we got up to, I think, 97 or 98 percent. And for a while, I thought that was good enough, but we still pissed off a lot of customers. And so we just decided to basically start from the ground, ground zero and just redo our entire warehousing system, rewrite our, all our software. And actually, we have a label on every single shoebox that tracks individual shoeboxes, uh, kind of by serial number, the equivalent of having a license plate. Uh, for cars, and so today our uh, inventory accuracy is something like 99.999% accurate. We have our auditors in our bank come in and audit us every quarter or so, and they choose 500 random shoes from our database, and they find all of them, and they're just kind of blown away because they've never seen anything like that, and they and they wonder like, why did we invest so much in making sure that it's that accurate? Why not just 99%? And the reason is because it actually is a big deal as for, I mean, for me personally as a consumer, like I, I'm not too happy when uh, they tell me they're out of stock after I've already placed the order. Lesson number five, centrally locate your distribution. So when we first started, we, um, we started out in San Francisco and so our office was our warehouse. And then we, as we expanded, we actually, um, had a 30,000 square foot facility uh, in Chico. And the reason we had it in California was just because that was close to our offices. It was easier for us to manage. But that meant that some of our East Coast customers, or most of our East Coast customers, they would have to wait five, seven, eight days in order to get something when they ordered it from us. So while it was easier for us, like it was worse for our customers. And we found that the customers that got our packages more quickly that were in states that were closer to California ended up being more loyal customers. They bought from us more often and more of them bought from us. And so we actually, uh, about four or five years ago, decided to relocate our uh, warehouse in Kentucky right next to the UPS hub. And as Alfred mentioned, we run our warehouse 24 seven and that allows us to get the shoes out to our customers as quickly as possible. We have an official cutoff time of 1 p.m. for if you place your order, but actually most of the customers that place their orders, like around by midnight Eastern, the shoes are on their doorstep eight hours later. 
And you know, once a customer experiences that once, that's they tell their friends. They're, it's like the most amazing thing, right? They think we're Santa Claus or something. And <laughs> so, and 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 then that's it's story worthy, they, and they're just hooked. And it's like a drug, and that's what we want. Uh, well, it's like certain drugs, and then. <laughs> And lesson number six, customer service is an investment, not an expense. So Alfred talked about you know, our warehouse, for example, running at 24-7. If you look at it as just you know, the, how much cash we're putting there, yes, it's not the most efficient way to run a warehouse. And, and so we view that as an investment. And same with our call center. Uh, it is more expensive to put our 1-800 number on every single page of our website. But as Alfred mentioned, we, we really view that as an investment, a branding opportunity, because we're here to build lifelong relationships with our customers. And so we're perfectly happy if someone calls, and this happens every day, someone just wants, you know, they're going to a wedding and they just want to browse with someone online for an hour, and, you know, we'll, we'll do that. Or they want to talk about their nine cats in their living room, and we'll be like, okay, yeah, whatever. And, and uh, it, but then it creates these relationships and these stories, and uh, and really that's what we're all about. You know, people, you know, other websites, competitors can eventually copy our selection, they can copy our policies, but what they can't copy is our culture and how our call center reps interact with customers because, you know, most of them are on scripts for other call centers, but even if they're not, like. If you don't have the company culture where you know people are encouraged just to be themselves and have fun and you know think of the company as a family, if if the employees aren't happy, then you're not going to give very good customer service. Right? It's pretty much impossible for an unhappy employee to give great service. Lesson number seven: Start small and stay focused. And so this kind of goes back to you know when we first launched uh, Zappos. We kind of tried to go out in a big way and you know had that big marketing campaign and you know the, we did get those four orders and uh, but but the problem is that we still didn't have everything right you know there were still logistical issues and you know all sorts of situations that you really just can't anticipate until you actually do it yourself and so I think a problem a lot of companies make uh, is that. You know, they try to go out in a big way, whereas our philosophy is really start small and stay focused. And you know, even and we're still applying that today. We launched uh, apparel maybe nine months ago on our website, but we didn't just go out and spend a hundred million dollars on inventory for apparel. We just kind of bought a little bit, and tested it out. There's you know issues to figure out, like how do you warehouse the product because apparel doesn't come in boxes, and then. We don't know how our customer is going to buy apparel. It, it, which types of styles are are they more interested in? Colors or more black, white, brown type of uh, non-colors? Or are they, you know, going to wear them and then try to return them? To, what do we need a special return policy? Like, there's just a lot of unknowns. And so, you know, whether it's with apparel or with sunglasses. We've just approached it in a very small, gradual way, and we want that business to grow organically over time. And so that's why we actually haven't gone out and had this huge marketing campaign saying, hey, we sell clothes now. Uh, we just want customers to slowly discover it, and then we get feedback from the customers as to what they like and don't like about clothing shopping on Zappos compared to shoe shopping, and then we improve our service slowly over time. And, I think in the long run, uh, even though we don't get to ramp up sales as quickly, it just ends up being better for the company. Lesson number eight, don't be secretive and don't worry about competitors. Uh, so in, when I give this presentation at a, sometimes it's at a conference where there's tons of retailers, and retailers just for whatever reason, and I guess business people as in general, but especially retailers, they like to be secret about everything because they worry that, you know, they'll, if someone finds out what sales are for, whether it's the company as a whole or for a particular brand or whatever, that they will somehow steal all the secrets of their business and they'll go out of business. And 
we, we take the opposite approach. Uh, and, and so most retailers, they actually do that to, to their, their own wholesalers that they're buying from. Like they, don't, they won't tell the wholesalers what's going on. Whereas for us, you know, if we're working with uh, a brand like say Kenneth Cole, uh, we actually share everything with them. We will let them look at what's in our inventory, what the sales are, what our margins are, and we have this extranet system where they can log in and view all that and really view everything that our own internal people can view. And, and so they can break it down by size, by style, you know, slice and dice the data however they want. And for us, our philosophy is, okay, yeah, you know, chances are probably someone, you know, from that brand is going to go share it with some other competitor that they also, that it also sells that brand. But that's okay because the benefit we get out of it is far more than any loss that we might get from information eventually falling in the hands of a competitor. Because with 1,200 brands on our website right now, we have 1,200 extra eyes looking at our business. So our own buyers might not miss because they're managing so many brands. They might miss that, oh, this one style is you know, rising to the top. We should, let's buy more of that so that we can sell it to our customers. But you know, for someone that's dedicated to that brand and that's all they look at, and they also know how that style is doing amongst other retailers, or just if other retailers are ordering them, then that's just a lot more, uh, it, it just end, creates a win-win situation. Like our business grows and the wholesaler's business grows and that's all by just being more transparent and open with them. And in terms of worrying about competitors, you know, Alfred mentioned how we refer customers to other online uh, retailers that might also sell footwear. And the reason for that is because ultimately what we, we really don't care what our competitors are doing, right? Like, what, if they're successful, great for them. Uh, as long as we're successful as well, we don't, it really doesn't benefit us if they're successful or not successful, as long as our business is growing. So what we really focus on are our customers and, you know, things like how often are they buying from us and, you know, how much do they buy over the next 12 months and, and so on. And as long as those numbers are going up, then who cares what our competitors are doing? Because if you focus too much on what competitors are doing, then that means you're probably not focusing enough on what really matters, which is the customers. So lesson number nine, you need to actively manage your company culture. And this is probably actually the most um, important slide, I would say, because at, at Zappos, our number one priority com company-wide is our company culture, making sure that as we grow, we don't lose that culture. So, you know, we told earlier about how we met doing the pizza business, and then uh, after graduating from college, I actually started a company called Link Exchange. It was an internet company uh, with the guy that I was running the pizza business with. And we grew that to about 100 or so people. The company started in 96 and then grew to about 100 or so people, and we sold it to Microsoft in 98. And what most people don't realize is why we sold the company. And the reason we sold it was because you know, it was a lot of fun when it was five people. It was a lot of fun when it was 10 people. We were you know, sleeping under our desks every night. We had no idea what day of the week it was. It was just, it was, it was great. There was so much energy and passion in that company. And then slowly over time, you know, we hired people that had all the right skills and experience and technical capability, but they weren't culture fits. And, but we hired them anyways because we didn't know any better to pay attention to culture fit. And by the time it got to the 100th person, it just wasn't a fun place to work anymore. Like, I didn't look forward to going to the office anymore. So, you know, and it's not like there was any one hire where, you know, this person brought the company downhill culture-wise. It, it was really just kind of a gradual thing. And so today at Zappos, like, that's why we actually spend so much time on culture. It's not just the hiring where, you know, in terms of HR does their culture fit interview and they, if, they, if they're not a culture fit, we won't hire them no matter what. And it's not just the performance reviews, it's we try to instill in every employee, especially in the managers, that 
their number one job is to maintain the company culture, to grow the company culture, to inspire the culture in others. And you know, there are so many large companies out there where you know, they're kind of like faceless corporations when you go there and, and it's like no one enjoys working there. They're just there for a paycheck. And we want to make sure that Zappos is not that place. We want it to be a place where people feel like, you know, when you're going to work, you're just going to the office to hang out with friends. And because we screen everyone for culture fit, you know, everyone actually does end up being friends. And, you know, after work, what do people do? They go down to, you know, the local bar and have a few drinks with other Zappos people. Not because they are forced to, but because that's actually what they want to do. And it makes a huge difference in terms of, you know, how much more smoothly everyone works together because people get to know each other both inside and outside the office. And there's just communications a lot easier. There's a lot more trust. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's just a lot more fun. You know, most people spend most of their more time at work than doing anything else. And so why not have that be, you know, one of, that should be enjoyable. The people talk about work-life balance. Well, that kind of implies that, it, you know, if you need a balance, then that means work sucks. And so <laughs> our philosophy is that, you know, why, like you wouldn't want to balance, you know, things where if it didn't suck, then, you know, for us, Zappos is just a lifestyle. It's not about a job. It's about what you do, you know, inside and outside the office. And you hang out with friends inside the office. You hang out with friends, Zappos people outside the office. And so company culture is really important to us. And, you know, it's not just about going to the bar and having drinks with people. Like, people organize golf outings, hiking trips, running uh, what, it could be whatever people's interests are, and there are enough other people in the company where if they're encouraged to participate in our culture and in the Zappos lifestyle, then uh, people actually get together and have a great time, meet people from different departments, and that's actually, in those settings, are when the most important conversations at Zappos happen. That's when people come up with their ideas because they are not under pressure. They don't feel like they're working. And uh, it, it's, to us, it's, it is our number one focus as a company, and we think it's our number one competitive advantage. Now, in terms of uh, cult, I go back once. So one other thing about the culture is, uh, the thing I just talked about was really the family-focused uh, part of it. But our culture is also about making sure that everyone understands the value of customer service. And you know, for us, customer service isn't just the call center, which is what it is at most companies, but it is the entire company. And um, I guess I'll, I'll tell you a story about, uh, there, there was actually a woman a few months ago, her husband ordered uh, shoes from us, and uh, you know, we shipped them overnight, and he got them, but unfortunately, the next day he was killed in a car accident on his way home. And so the wife called us and uh, wanted help with the return, which you know we helped her with as probably any company would. But what happened was the rep that took the call took it upon herself to send flowers to her. And so when the woman received the flowers, like she was just so touched that you know this a company would actually care to send flowers. And at the funeral, there were 20 or 30 other family members there. She told the story to all of them. And so not only is that woman, you know, Zappos customer for life, but so are those 20 or 30 other people. And, you know, we don't have a policy for things like that. Uh, we don't have a script. We don't have kind of a standard operating procedure manual. Like that was just something that the rep felt was the right thing to do because she understood our culture. And if you get the culture right, then a lot of the other stuff will fall into place on its own. And so that's why we focus so much on company culture. I'll also give an example from our uh, warehouse operations. We had a woman that uh, ordered a wallet from us 
and you know, she ended up not liking that wallet, so she shipped it back to us. We paid for the shipping back to us. What she didn't realize was that she had accidentally left $160 in the wallet when she shipped it back to us. So, you know, she had two little kids and, you know, was beating on them for the next couple of days, like trying to get one of them to fess up and uh, not literally beating them, but <laughs> getting mad at them. And, uh, and you know, n none of them had any idea what she was talking about, you know, mom's crazy. And then, and then like a few days later, she received an envelope in the mail with $160 in a card from one of our warehouse workers in Kentucky. And the card just said, you know, you returned the wallet, found this, thought you might like it. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, she was just amazed by that and, you know, is now a Zappos customer for life and has told other people about it. And the point of that story is that, you know, our culture is not just about our customer service department. It's company-wide. And that warehouse worker could have easily pocketed the money and no one would have any clue that that's what happened. But because our com customer service focus is part of our culture and we emphasize company culture across the entire company, you know, even in the Kentucky warehouse, like it, every department has these chances to create lasting memories with our customers. And uh, Alfred uh, talked earlier about ordering pizza from Zappos. And uh, so, yeah, we don't actually deliver pizza. But um, I was in Santa Monica a couple, a couple months ago and uh, speaking at a conference. And it was, the, the, it was Skechers uh, Global Sales Conference. And so Alfred, myself, and uh, a couple other Zappos people were there. And, uh, and then we went out uh, with a few people from Skechers um, and you know, had maybe one drink too many that night, or maybe three or four too many drinks, and, and uh, got back to the hotel room around one o'clock, and one of the Skechers people really wanted a pizza, and so tried ordering room service. Unfortunately, they don't serve cold, they don't serve warm food after 11 p.m., so the rest of us thought it'd be pretty funny if we tried to call Zappos and order pizza. And we're like, yeah, great idea. You call. No, you call. And then, so we had the Skechers person call and, um, and put it on speakerphone. And the rep that answered had no idea that the rest of us were listening. It was just, you know, the Skechers rep talking. And, you know, the rest of us were, haha, this is so funny. Try not to make noise. And, uh, and so she's like, I'm just, you know what? I'm starving and I really need a pizza. And I'm in Santa Monica. What do I do? And uh, the rep was like, what? And <laughs> so she, she repeated it. And then uh, rep put her on hold for two minutes and then came back later with, uh, two minutes later, with the five closest places that were still open and delivering pizza in Santa Monica. So we don't have a procedure for that or uh, you know, any policy on that. But that's just an example where, you know, for something as silly as ordering pizza, if you get the culture right, then our reps will always take care of the customer. And that's something that you're not going to be able to find at probably almost any other company out there. And uh, finally, lesson number 10, be wary of so-called experts, including us. <laughs> so you know, throughout the past eight and a half years, we spent a lot of money on con outside consultants, and anything from you know, consultants for the call center to uh, how to run our technology, how to run our warehouse, and so on. And pretty much what we've learned almost every single time is that we should have just done it ourselves and trusted ourselves more. And uh, not only were the consultants expensive you know, from what we actually had to pay them, but we also found that they usually gave us the wrong advice in terms of what was right for our business. And you know, at the end of the day, you're bringing in people from the outside you know, to get advice from them, and they're not living your business on a daily basis. They don't understand your business. The only people that understand your business are the people in the business. And so 
you know, our kind of advice to everyone is, yes, sometimes consultants might give you a fresh outside perspective or, you know, there might be a nugget of good information here and there, but don't rely on outside consultants. Just trust yourself, trust your people, because nobody else knows your business better. And uh, that's it for the top 10 lessons, and uh, we will open up for Q&A. So let's do this. Oh, um, okay. Let's all, let's uh, have just a couple minutes for questions at 610. <clears throat> if people want to stay for questions past 610, we'll just have them come up uh, offline. But I think there's, there's a couple minutes, all right? Okay. So, uh, question? There, there's one here. Oh, repeat the question. So, okay. yeah. Uh, just one, just to make sure, you're a private company, right? Yes, we're a private company. Okay, do you think this business model would have survived with all the shareholder pressure you would have if you were public? I'm not the CFO, so I'll let Alfred answer that. <laughs> well, I think you got to be able to explain uh, what your strategy is. And there have been plenty of companies that have stayed private for a long period of time because they don't want the outside public shareholder pressure. We still have shareholders. We have shareholders. We. We have uh, Sequoia Capital who invested in us as well. Uh, and Tony and, and I ran a venture fund, Venture Frogs. We, we invested in the company. Tony personally put some money in. So we still have investors to answer to. So you have to be able to articulate what your strategy is right and why in the long run you expect to make uh, sig significant amounts of money. So things like you know, putting up there, how much do we acquire, how much money do you spend to acquire a customer how much do you make on the first purchase? How much do you expect the life value of those customers to be? Uh, you, we spend time quantifying that to make our uh, investors uh, feel comfortable. Um, so those things help. Uh, we have had to run the company at basically break even for the past first six years or so the, because there really weren't any investors really willing to put a ton of money in 1999, 2000, 2001 uh, into an e-commerce company because so many bad e-commerce companies spent all their money marketing and lost money. And so that, for us, that was a, both a curse because we couldn't raise money, but a, a truly a blessing in disguise. And so, you know, <coughs> great businesses can self-fund for long periods of time. And if, if you can do that, that's great. Or be creative and figure out other ways to finance the business. We have to buy a lot of inventory. So, we have always worked with our uh, partners to, to um, vendor partners to give us credit lines as well. So that, that's a way to fund your business. So the question is, how does Zappos interview for culture fit? Um, actually, let me give you a little bit of background on how the culture thing happened. We, you know, in the beginning, of the company, as Tony said, when you're you know in the stage of five, ten, fifteen, maybe even up to fifty employees, it's pretty easy to know whether someone fits or not because you have a small group of people. When you get to a larger group of employees, you start seeing some people don't fit. You start seeing the ones that work really, really well. And about uh, two years ago, Tony uh, spent a lot of time just thinking through and asking for suggestions on. Uh, what would be the core values of the company? And initially, I think we got about 43 or so <laughs> different core values. That's way too many. So we combined some, thought about who, who really didn't fit in the company, who, who did, and con condensed into 10 core values. And out of those core values, we have a questionnaire that sort of tries to evaluate whether someone is going to deliver well through service, uh, going to be a little fun, going to be fun and a little weird is another one of our core values who's someone who's willing to in, embrace and drive change and do more with less. Those are some of our core values, but there are detailed questions underneath each of those um, core values because we spent so much time documenting what those core values mean. I, I mean, I guess a simplified way that in terms of how I think about it is like when I talk to someone, I'm like, does this person annoy me? And if the answer is yes or maybe a little bit yes, then we won't hire them. So. <laughs> And, and, and so one of our core values, for example, is to be humble. So if someone comes in and was like, I did this and I'm so great and blah, 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 we're, we're not going to hire that person. All right. Um, I know that a lot of, because of the timing of the class and all, well, let's do two things. One, for people who want to stick around and, and chat and have like detailed questions, come down and everybody else, let's thank our speakers.